I'd really like to thank uh, uh, um, uh, Rob Wemelson and the FDR um, uh, group for inviting me to this conference. And as I mentioned to Rob earlier today, I've used this as an opportunity uh, to go rogue and talk about uh, uh, some issues that I usually don't get to talk about. And uh, yeah, just to uh, provide a brief overview of what I consider to be some iconoclastic thoughts, although I think that in this audience it's probably not so iconoclastic. But I want to uh, highlight the points that I believe that psychiatry today is really suffering uh, from a flawed taxonomy, that our current concepts of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder lack firm neuroscientific foundations, that the observed syndromes reflect continua of brain function and dysfunction rather than discrete categories, and that the persistence of uh, such diversity genetically points to adaptive advantages or certain traits that are linked to these continua and that we would be well served to recognize those. Uh, and I think this has uh, very important, indeed profound implications for all neuropsychiatric research and treatment development. Um, uh, uh, Steve had mentioned uh, that we um, uh, won an award from the NIH Roadmap uh, and were able to establish a consortium for neuropsychiatric genomics as part of the NIH Roadmap initiative. They have a theme, research teams of the future. Uh, since we'd already spent the money from the past, it was hard to get money in the present. We figured the future was a good place to go. And we developed candidate logos. This was my favorite logo. Um, which was the universal warning sign uh, about using the DSM-4. Um, and uh, the NIH Roadmap Initiative uh, said that we had to identify fundamental roadblocks in our area of inquiry. And uh, so one of the things that we thought is uh, uh, saleable was that these diagnostic systems, as we all know, are atheoretical. They're unrelated to pathophysiological or etiological hypotheses. That the phenotypes, moreover, that we're aiming to discover the genetic basis for are simply descriptive based on symptoms that are so remote from the underlying biological processes that gene discovery suffers from a lack of biologically valid phenotypes and that drug discovery continues to proceed largely by trial and error. So um, we, along with many others, like Dr. Phillips, as you heard earlier, are searching for more biologically relevant quantitative trait phenotypes, um, but a lot of advances are needed to achieve those kinds of lofty goals. Um, it's interesting, and I wanted to use this uh, talk as an opportunity to talk a little bit more about the issue of categorical versus dimensional models uh, of psychopathology, which have a very rich history. Um, and uh, it, it's interesting that um, categorical models arose from attempts to impose some structure on what were clinically observed psychological problems. But uh, I believe that there's little evidence supporting the validity of the existing categories of mental disorders on a neurobiological grounds. Instead, most psychopathology can be viewed as quantitative deviation along continuous trait dimensions that merge imperceptibly from normalcy into more pathological ranges. Um, there are some uh, esteemed scientists and investigators who have uh, had very similar views. Cloninger um, said that there's no empirical evidence for natural boundaries between the major syndromes, that the categorical approach is fundamentally flawed. And it's interesting in looking at some of the historians of categorical versus dimensional approaches. Hempel wrote in 1961 that most sciences start with a categorical classification of their subject matter, but often replace this with dimensions as more accurate measurement becomes possible. Um, <coughs> it's also interesting, Rounceville more recently said, it's probably significant that most of the advocates of dimensional representation are not practicing clinicians, but are primarily theoreticians. <laughs> and so I went to the world's most important authority um, a Google image uh, to come up with uh, uh, something that would illustrate this dichotomy. And I found a theoretician um, a, a picture that I think no one could look more like a theoretician than Ludwig Boltzmann. <laughs> um, look at uh, the beard and glasses, I think, really sealed the deal for me. Uh, but he had a nice quote that theory is the most practical thing conceivable, the quintessence of practice. And then, of course, because I wanted to make fun of them, I tried to find categorical thinkers of whom House uh, I think was the best I could, uh, if people don't know him, he's a, uh, there's a TV show where he makes all kinds of improbable diagnoses based on things that just fly to his brain. And then I really love this picture because here's a man who is performing a detailed physical examination and has determined that this is a tree. Uh, <laughs> but there is a whole uh, uh, science dedicated to determining empirically and scientifically whether or not observed phenomena are better represented as categories or uh, dimensions. And uh, this is uh, from the discipline that's been known as taxometrics, and this is the taxometrician's warning sign um, that there are gophers and there are chipmunks, but there are no goth monks. And so uh, a science has emerged, a statistical discipline um, that is aiming at to try to discern whether what we're looking at is really a dimensional 
uh, uh, representation or whether there really do exist categories. And uh, this has grown, I, and I listed some of the um, currently and uh, more historically used methods. I mean, let's say you're looking at a trait of something. The neatest thing is when you can see clear evidence of bimodality in trait scores. Um, so if you look at a distribution of some kind of a trait, um, that uh, if you can really see that there's a nice separation uh, in the trait, then that, that can convince you that there may be categories there. Um, I think that uh, just for example, if you take groups of men and women and examine the size of external genitalia, um, there tends to be a bimodal distribution uh, uh, in that kind of a measurement. Um, but that's not very often found um, in many other biological dimensions, um, nor is it found uh, in, in psychiatry. Uh, cluster analytic procedures have been developed. Um, they have actually a pretty poor track record. The, the neat thing about them is they're biased to yield clusters. You can get as many as you want, even if they don't exist. So uh, that's what makes them so attractive. Um, uh, taxometrics, as I, as I mentioned, uh, has a relatively better track record, uh, developed largely by uh, the genius Paul Meal, and then his followers have advanced it. Uh, uh, it assumes independent indicators in only two classes. There's some statistical assumptions there that make it somewhat less tractable. Since then, other um, advanced methods have been developed, finite mixture modeling, latent class analysis, uh, and factor mixture modeling, which brings together the modeling of latent classes along with latent variables. And this seems to be the current state of the art. Um, I think that when we look at the uh, successes um, and failures of uh, search for taxon uh, or tax, taxa, um, we find that if we look through the DSM, there's uh, very little evidence for categories and a lot of evidence for dimensions. So if we look where there's positive evidence for some categorical structure, there are certain subtypes of melancholia, maybe social phobia or inhibited temperament in childhood that there are some kids who are really different than others, and bulimia nervosa um, may be a discrete category, but the DSM uh, currently has the uh, category probably uh, ill-defined. And then dissociative identity disorder if it is a narrow definition that seems to represent a discrete class of people, and hypnotic susceptibility, interestingly enough, seems to be an area where there is a discrete group of people who are more susceptible than others. However, for uh, depression, all other kinds of melancholia, all subtypes, Dimensional approaches seem to be much better in representing those syndromes. PTSD, generalized anxiety, avoidance attachment style, anxiety uh, and panic disorders, all of these things seem to be better represented as continua and occur on a spectrum. Even for um, the uh, uh, thing that I'm closest to uh, and have been studying uh, uh, for 30 years or so, um, the psychotic disorders, uh, schizotypal personality disorder, there's some evidence that there may be a discrete taxon also maybe antisocial personality disorder, but all of the other interpersonal and affective components of psychopathy, borderline personality disorder, and almost all models of personality function highlight the importance of continua, not discrete types, categories, or disorders. I think that uh, my favorite poster child for um, continua or dimensional approaches versus categorical approaches is ADHD. Uh, recently, the fanciest of the statistical models I was just talking about was applied to the study of the symptoms of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder uh, as a great group, uh, including a number of our uh, colleagues here at UCLA. Uh, and uh, they did factor mixture modeling on ADHD symptoms. This enabled them in the same data set to simultaneously look to see whether there were latent dimensions and whether there were latent classes or groups or clusters of people who really disting distinguished themselves. And uh, the bottom line is that they found that there were two continuous factors. They represented severity of inattentiveness and uh, hyperactivity or impulsivity, and there was a lot of variability in those, do in those dimensions, um, but there was no support for any qualitatively distinct ADHD subtypes. So what this means is that the people who end up being labeled or classified as having ADHD really just reflect the, the bottom 10% of people who exist and are better described on these quantitative trait distributions of inattentiveness and impulsivity. Now, what's the state of the art for psychoses? Um, is this real? science that we're following. Now here we have uh, Kriflin, um, the godfather of uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, schizophrenia research. Um, and fascinatingly enough, the current diagnostic definitions and boundaries that are applied today um, uh, for schizophrenia and manic depressive disorders are almost identical to those that we had in 1899. Uh, the definitions include the division of schizophrenia into the so-called paranoid, catatonic, uh, and disorganized or hebephrenic subtypes, 
Um, but there remains no substantive neuroscientific validation for any of those distinctions. Um, the question of whether there are diseases or syndromes has uh, arisen many times um, and, and is increasingly questioned. Um, is, I, I believe, along with Kendler and Gardner, that the prototypical mental disorders, major depressive disorder, anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder, all merge imperceptibly both into one another and into normality. And there are no demonstrable natural boundaries or zones of rarity in between them. Further, both the genetic and environmental factors underlying these syndromes are really nonspecific. Um, looking back to the history of this, I don't know, is Professor Berrios here? No, he was here yesterday, I believe. No? Uh, well, anyhow, I was worried because anytime uh, that one talks about history and Professor Berrios is in the room, I feel very intimidated because he actually knows most of this history and most of the things I've gotten have come from work that he's participated in. But I uh, found that. Uh, um, uh, Francois uh, Boissier de Sauvage de La Croix, pardon my French. Um, yes, I see um, uh, Professor Chesselet is cringing only so slightly <laughs> and trying to be as supportive as possible. She's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful colleague, but she can pronounce that for you later. Uh, but anyhow, in 1763, he wrote a book called uh, Nosologia uh, Methodica. Um, which in fact inspired Pinnell, who could be seen as one of the godfathers of modern psychiatric classification. Anyhow, he did a great thing. He's a botanist, but also uh, classified individual diseases into 10 classes, 44 orders, 315 genera, and 2,400 species. And interestingly enough, this included a lot of the mental disorders. That was one of his 10 classes. Um, and then, in contrast, there's always been a tension and a bit of a pendulum swing between uh, the sort of discrete taxonic approach and the dimensional approach. Zeller seems to have reflected um, uh, 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 the dimensional approach going back again into the 18th century. And uh, I particularly liked what he referred to them as the state pictures or Zustandsbilder, uh, primarily because of the uh, final word uh, there. Uh, <laughs> I identified very strongly with this. And, uh, but anyhow, he uh, defined these, and I don't want to reveal my German being even worse than my French, uh, but the Schwermut, uh, melancholia, mania, paranoia, and dementia. He not only identified these um, uh, components of psychopathology, but further that they defined a continuum of increasing psychological disorganization that ran from uh, melancholia through mania to paranoia and dementia. 